Hello, everyone, and welcome after a break. Welcome to our afternoon block of the sessions. Um, this uh, we've heard this morning from Finnish experience and the French experience, and now we're moving to Germany. So this session is called Sharing is Caring, a German view on patients' health data. And we will explore what are the opportunities, but also risks of sharing health data from the patient's perspective especially in the context of the EU's plans for the EHDS. Together with the expert, we want to discuss the current debate in Germany. And this debate will be moderated by Christian Klausen, who is Director of Patient Advocacy and a key member of a global patient advocacy team at Pfizer. With nearly two decades of experience at both national and international levels, Christina has uh, spearheaded co-creation alliances with patient organization. At Pfizer, she pioneered a patient-centric approach, engaging interest groups and political actors in decision-making processes. And prior to Pfizer, she also served as a consultant for health and social policy at AUKA and in health economics at the Federal Union of German Pharmacists Association. So with all this experience, uh, she's moderating this exciting panel, um, Christina. The microphone is yours. Thank you so much, Carolina, for your very warm welcome. And I want to extend this uh, to all our panelists. Yes, in fact, today we are um, discussing about sharing is caring, a German view on patients' health data. And uh, it's so wonderful to see you all here. We are discussing this in light of the European health data space. And we are reflecting risks and opportunities, chances, um, but also um, our wishes and the, the bright vision from a patient perspective, because this is the heart of the session. We are doing everything with Bern's support uh, on behalf of the patients, on behalf of the caregivers. And in doing so, we tie in in the World Health Summit. So some weeks ago here in Berlin, the World Health Summit took place and Pfizer initiated the first Pfizer a patient panel in this conference. And we discussed together with Sylvia and Bernd to a similar topic and we invited many, many experienced patient advocates around the world. So from Latin America and US and Canada, Europe, Africa, Middle East, and Asia Pacific. And what I learned there was a very, very clear message. Patient experts stated that they want to be involved. They want their voices to be heard in any point of the decision making around health data, around digitalization. And so with the strong mandate, <laughs> I think, uh, we are starting the session uh, today here in this uh, uh, very important conference, and I feel very, very grateful uh, and want to thank SNPC that we are empowered to do this uh, today. Let me introduce uh, the, um, the panelists before we start, and I, uh, I may start with you, um, Professor Sylvia Thun. So Sylvia is one of my best friends, if I may say so. She's one of the top experts on the topic of digital health in Germany and beyond. Uh, she is a licensed physician and an engineer for biomedical technology and professor for digital medicine and interoperability at the Berlin Institute um, for Health Research called BEH at Charité Berlin. You have many more titles, Sylvia. Please forgive me that I focus on this, but I know you have a big heart also for the patients and you are the perfect keynote speaker for our session here uh, today. Uh, I want also uh, um, want to welcome uh, by heart Bernd Rosenbichler. Bernd Rosenbichler, you, I think many of you know him uh, via LinkedIn. He is very active on the international level. He's a social entrepreneur and former automotive manager. He's committed to improving public awareness of rare disease, especially Alström syndrome, in order to achieve concrete progress in the field of research and care for effective uh, patients and their relatives. And what I learned from, from Bernd in, in previous discussions, that he is straight to the point and very, very much oriented at 
facts and figures and real progress. He, he is not here to waste uh, any time. He is here to change the world. Very warm, warm welcome, uh, Bernd Rosenbichler. Yeah. And another friend is here. You can all see him. It's uh, Dr. Georg Arne Klebert. Uh, called Oppo. He is vice president uh, of Pfizer, head of machine learning research. He's a computer scientist with strong expertise in the development of machine learning methods. And his, uh, he has extensive experience in the analysis of high dimensional data. I know that he is much, much more than when I just summarized here. But uh, I feel very, very grateful, um, uh, Dr. Kleber, that, that you uh, took uh, the, the time to, to be with us today because you have much to share. I know this, not only in, in your current um, Pfizer position, but also from your previous experiences. Yeah. We That's also, hmm. <laughs> thank you, uh, Otto. Um, we also uh, experience uh, to uh, or expect to. To join is uh, Dr. Peter Liesen. He is member of the European Parliament and he's very, very busy. So I apologize that he's coming a little bit late, uh, but I think this is um, this is, should not worry us. Um, I think he will be uh, then there in time for our panel discussion. So with this, um, I think we can start our session because we, we set the scene. And thank you for each and everyone who uh, joined our session now. So Sylvia, the floor is yours and please tell us where we stand now with, um, with the European Health Data Space and, and especially um, what is the German situation, Sylvia. So could you, could you give me the access? So to, to uh, share my screen, please. Okay. I think it's coming. It's there. So everything what we are doing at Charity. Can you see it? I see a blank white screen, to be very honest. But it's developing, I hope. Maybe someone from the technical team can help us now. So here we go. Wonderful. Oh, okay. yeah. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. so everything, what we are doing at charity is for patients. And um, right now we are trying to develop a German health data space here. And I will, first of all, I will show you some laws which are now on their way. Um, tomorrow I'm at the Bundestag and we try to overcome like the um, problem that we don't have so much um, precise data in Germany and here's our new German digitization strategy. And you can see here that we want to roll out our um, electronic health record, um, not only for normal diseases, but also for complex diseases and especially for oncology. We want to work with telemedicine services and use cloud-based systems. We want to um, have a new um, digital health agency, which is much more uh, or nearer to the uh, German Ministry of Health. And uh, we want to have a data-driven environment here in Germany. So this is all what we have to do. And there's a lot of work in front of us. And uh, how do we do it? First of all, we have many challenges, so different languages, not only like people who talk different languages, but the syntactic and semantic interoperability is our biggest challenge beside data security issues. And we are right now on our way and we always work together with uh, international um, experts and their standards. Uh, since many, many years, but it's not really implemented in Germany right now. And we are trying to force now the industry, but also the um, people, the users to use the standards that are um, uh, set all over the world. So this is how Germany looks like today. <laughs> we work here with free text, sure, and no 
classifications or terminologies which are included here. You can see the death certificate on the top left corner. But we have some things uh, which are um, really successful, like the medication plan. And within the barcode, you can find a well-known standard, which is called FIRE, Fast Healthcare Interoperability Resources. Um, this is a standard that you can exchange data all over the world if you wish to. And our e-prescription is now like um, successful. And we still work with plastic cards. Uh, so everybody gets a plastic card here in Germany, um, the patients and the doctors and all other um, care providers as well. So um, how do we build our strategy? We um, had a look at the World Health Organization, who has now a collaboration with HL7, which is the Health Level 7 international group, which sets the standards for the world. And um, beside that, there is the family of international classification as well. And uh, you all know the ICD-10, the International Classification of Diseases. And if you are using these international classifications, you cannot only translate um, the things that are uh, really important for each patient, but you can um, put it together with other information you have, like from the weather or from uh, former procedures and so on. And besides that, uh, genomic data gets uh, really important. And there's a huge uh, um, project going on right now, which is called Genom.de. In Germany, we, where we try to, to have a governance for genomic data. Yeah, and we all know that uh, DICOM is a well-known standard that we can um, uh, transfer images even to the patient. But uh, right now um, on a DVD or CD in Germany. Okay, this is um, how it looks like in Germany. And we are on our way to the International Patient Summary, which is mentioned at the EHDS as well, the European Health Data Space. They pointed out that the... Um, EHR for all um, uh, my health at EU EHR should be based on HL7 standards, which is mainly a programming language um, in JSON and uh, should include the implementation guide of the International Patient Summary, which we have built 10 years ago in Euro Europe and is now in place, for instance, in um, Austria. Let's go to the European Health Data Space. Um, yeah, we want to empower our uh, citizen. And I think this is ex extremely important um, to have more health data literacy via electronic health devices. And not only the record, but more than that, because you can use the record and you can use your watch and whatever you want to use, but you have to align all the data. So you can do upon this data, which should be in a very uh, quality high a way, um, algorithms that help you in your uh, daily um, life. So to have better diagnosis and treatment and better health policy, greater opportunities for research and innovation as well. And I want to show you one use case from research. One slide about FIRE again. FIRE is not just only a standard, which is an ISO standard and many, many vendors use the standard. It's, it's also a community, a vivid community of hundreds of thousands of people and not only technical people, but medical people as well and nurses who work with the standard and who try to standardize the standard <laughs> to make healthcare uh, uh, data better. But you need more than just um, the... Um, programming language, you need the language itself. And you can see here on the right hand side that it is very complicated. Uh, you have more than 500 different uh, concepts just for um, some um, panels or for the DENG uh, virus and so on. So this is um, something that we have um, to know that we need the language as well. And many, many uh, European um, countries are trying now to, to use this LOING and SNOMED and ICD standard within the EHR. Coming to our scientific 
project, which is called Medical Informatics Initiatives. We have an architecture which is based on this fire standard and the fire so-called resources. And they use the international languages like SNOMED and LOING and Orphanet for rare diseases. And uh, now we are able not only to exchange data with all 34 university hospitals, but uh, we can query the data. This is in German, but you can see that we have more than 300 million uh, lab results here included um, and uh, procedures, uh, medications and so on. And then we can just query our health data platform the German portal for medical research data. I always say this is the small EHDS. Um, and then you can query and see if, if there's data or not. And um, if, if you need the data, you can just ask the university to give you the data in an anonymized or pseudonymized way. Uh, this depends on the broad consent. If people have given their broad consent to this platform, you get the uh, data in a pseudonymized way. So these are just some of the projects which are right now going on. So um, to, to combine health care data with weather data, for instance, or to ask questions about rare diseases or lab results and diagnosis and so on. And we can use this data also to combine it with registry data. We have more than 400 registries in Germany, but they are not harmonized and not standardized yet, but we are on our way. There's a new law coming for registries. And beside that, we try to have huge platforms within some cities like Berlin. And within Berlin, we just built this platform that our um, physicians can get access This is what I like to uh, give you with here in <laughs> that what I want to educate you um, to use the FAIR principles, which uh, says that data should be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And um, we need data for secondary use, especially for um, science and for registries to have a maximum benefit for patients then. And um, this can aid the democratization of medicine and support patients. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lydia. This was a very, very comprehensive, very, very logic and um, very fruitful impulse for, for our session. I don't see um, uh, Dr. Peter Liesen now. So, so, so I would then hand over to you, Bernd, directly. Because, uh, as I said before, we don't want to um, uh, discuss um, with our patients. We want to do this with you, and you are not a patient yourself, not not, not that much. I hope, <laughs> but but you are you are here for for your son, for for Ben, and um, and for Alzheimer's syndrome and rare disease. So um, when you um, have heard now and listened to Sylvia, what what is what is your first reaction? from a patient perspective. Okay, thanks, Christina. Uh, ba basically, my first reaction is, and I've, uh, I have to say I've, I've seen the presentation and I know Sylvia, so it, it wasn't totally new information. And it's uh, first of all, it's great uh, that we're advancing, that we're advancing, say, at a, at a, at a very good speed and, and that we are really maybe trying to catch up a little bit uh, also in terms of a, of a global comparison uh, if it comes to working with data and, and, and using digital tools uh, for whatever reason. But uh, I'm, I'm looking, maybe I'm looking out of a very small segment uh, on, the, on the usage of data, which is the rare diseases. And, and rare diseases, I think, they haven't been so much in the focus recently, but if it comes to data, data analysis, and, and all the tools that are uh, currently arising, I think it's the, the biggest opportunity uh, for rare diseases in, in history, as simple as that, because so far we've simply been kind of too small 
each and every disease uh, to really get into into any kind of focus or or really get the attention of research. So coming from that, obviously I'm I'm as as father to a son who has a rare uh, disease and and as somebody who is talking a lot to the community. I'm, I'm simply I'm patient. Uh, you know, and and obviously seeing all the opportunities that are lying around there just had so many recent examples yesterday we went for example to a doctor um it was the first time that ben went there and it took me literally half an hour to explain everything about ben um because obviously there is no no documentation no summary of of the patient history and in our case we are in average consulting 10 doctors uh, a year so you have a lot of information and and putting all the strings together and explaining to somebody who is new it takes a lot of time and effort on both sides on the doctor's side on our side which is simply inefficient so uh l- looking at these kind of examples uh, and there is tools you know how how you can fix it so i'm, I'm obviously uh, not very patient if it comes to that and and when we hopefully put rare diseases more and more into the focus and and that's my biggest concern, actually, looking at e- EHDS or, or other initiatives. I mean, these are huge, huge complex tanker. I see that we have now really the, the honor and the pleasure to work together on a patient registry for Alstom. 30 data sets. That, that's not massive. And it takes years, years to set it up in, in the right and proper standards. And I doubt that there is much value for us as patients in it. Um, so, so what I would really love to see is uh, a little bit more of a kind of speedboat thinking. Uh, if we're talking about data, that we look at certain topics where we maybe act differently than we do when building like the big vision for Europe or 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 any other uh, bigger con- uh, construct. And that that would speed up things, uh, and and that would also I think help patients because. Sometimes I, 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 I've, I've created a line like uh, unleash the beast, the patient. Uh, sometimes I have the feeling that uh, th- there is a certain fear of, of getting patients involved because they are obviously impatient and, and they want to get things moving. And uh, of course, uh, we, we know that things may take long, but at the end of the day, it can only help the work with data because to be honest, patients are the only one who have no commercial interest. They, they 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 don't want to make money. They they are not afraid of anything. They just want help for themselves. And that that I think for me is a is a huge opportunity that we need to to I think to explore more. And I, I was just recently in Spain and I, I had a discussion with somebody from Switzerland. They are now setting up a kind of safe space for working with data where you can do research, where there is say less regulation, uh, where science, where uh, uh, the businesses and patients are coming together to explore opportunities, uh, especially for rare diseases. And I think these are the the types of solution out of a patient perspective that I would love to see more, you know, not 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 taking away anything from from all the activities, these brilliant activities going on, but there must be some room as well for these kind of speedboats, for these kind of maybe cases or diseases um, where you, you can act quicker and, and come up with solutions uh, which help on the one side and act maybe as a blueprint for the other side. So that's a kind of first insight uh, or some of the thoughts that I had during the conversation. Thank you so, so much, Bennett. I think this is more than understandable for each and every one who has relatives or family members suffering from 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 anything and and what we want is help as quick as possible so yes. for for really each and every one so i think um um the speedy kind of attitude or or, or um, the vision or not not a vision but but the goal yeah to have uh, quicker access to medical progress. This is also what drives you, Oppo, if I may say so. Yeah? Can you please uh, give us a, a short insight uh, what um, Vice President Machine Learning is doing at <laughs> Pfizer? <laughs> because because in in the past we had many many medicals in medical, yeah, but but we had no computer scientists or other experts, yeah, in in this company. 
So so please uh, just share with us wh what you are doing and then then I will uh, start the discussion a lot. Yeah. Hmm. Um, yeah, 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 of course. So yeah, um, so I'm, I'm leading a machine learning research group. I'm trying to give direction to a couple of scientists in our group how to develop certain algorithms that can help um, a pharmaceutical company um, to develop drugs at a lighter at light speed or faster let me say let me formulate it like that um so um so the current always we have the problem that um finding a new drug that um is bringing the certain um, effect um into the patient is something like serendipity it's a little bit like luck people don't want to hear it but it's a super hard project so typically we will have something we will see something like 95 percent failures we will have see a um, an investment going to the billions of um, US dollars, a timeline of 12 years to bring a new medical entity to the um, to the patient that can help them to um, treat certain um, rare, severe diseases, whatever it is. So um, since there is so much data out there, it's a question like, so how can we use this kind of data to better inform the scientists the chemist, for example, how to synthesize a drug, what kind of drug to synthesize next, or what compound to synthesize next. For example, that's a compound having less, um, is better solvable, so all that can penetrate the blood-brain um, barrier. Um, all these kind of stuff is happening. Um, that is one part, so that's going to the direction of generative chemistry. So these are principles that we exploit that people know maybe from stable diffusion where you can generate realistic looking like images of uh, cats wearing sunglasses or something like that. Now we can do this the same on the, on, the, on the chemical space. So we can generate a molecule that has a certain property and binds to a certain um, pocket of the all protein, for example, and is selective. Hmm? Um, other things is it that what we are doing, and that is actually the, the biggest problem why for, for coming up with new treatments, is it to identify um, a relationship between a protein that is um, in, uh, in, to, in some degree um, impaired in the human cell and the disease. Um, so if we, for example, see that a certain protein is downregulated or to upregulate it, then we can come up, develop an agonist or an antagonist for this protein, and then hopefully that we can steer, um, we can um, heal the patient. That is something that is um, very complicated now because all those monogenetic diseases, so where you have only one gene that is associated with the disease, are almost all identified now. So what we are seeing now is like really combinations of genes that are impaired. Um, that are hitting certain pathways, and that's what we are doing. We are done and dying to identify these kind of relationships from super large data sets. So from millions of uh, GWAS studies, we are trying to use these super large um, um, population genetics databases from UK Biobank, for example, where we have access to a large data set of molecular marker, molecular measurements, so gene expression, DNA sequences, and in combinations with certain observations or so clinical variable, clinical outcomes. And that allows us to identify these kind of relationships. That's what we are doing. Mm -hmm. And and Arco, can can you give us, um, if possible, in, in, in lay language, yeah, a kind of hope and <laughs> and an and ex example, um, how this new technology helps us as a society, not only as, as a company, to be quicker. And maybe, Silvia, you, you can also um, refer a bit, a bit um, uh, to, to this aspect. Because I see, uh, and, and I completely feel Bernd's need, completely. Yeah. So the question is now, how can we all help? So as far as, as a company, other companies included, yeah. how can, can medicals help, pharmacists, how can... Can can you have and and I think um, besides the um, sometimes complicated political pro uh, framework, yeah, both on on the European <laughs> and the German level, and this is there for sure. But but uh, can you give us an example or a little bit hope that that we are moving faster, even there are these big challenges and and and, and all the different languages, as, as you said before. Yeah, first of all, I'm sorry. <laughs> Should I first? 
Okay. First of all, we have to uh, diagnose uh, our patients and then we have to find them. So the biggest challenge is to, to have the uh, right diagnosis at the right time. And uh, right now we don't even have a terminology which is called uh, Offernet in, 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 in place here in Germany. So um, we don't write down, even if, if we have the um, diagnosis, or the symptoms or the lab results, which refer to uh, some rare disease. We, we don't write it down um, because it's not um, relevant for reimbursement. So we don't really have the data and we don't have a terminology in place in Germany. So if we um, want to find um, like five, five um, um, children with a, a special um, yeah. uh, diagnosis, we, we cannot really... Um, we cannot really find them because we, we don't have the data because it's not uh, written down in the um, hospital information system, for instance. And at Sylvia, are there any other countries in the world who are doing better than us? Um, I don't know. I don't think so. But um, countries who, who are using SNOMED or, or FONET are um, better than Germany, yes. Hmm. So, so there's... there's... There's an extra item I see. Um, and uh, I, I'm coming to, to, back to you uh, in, in a minute. Uh, so so when we were all at the World Health Summit, yeah, discussing also the fair principles, when, when I do remember um, the the feedback of, of one of the European patient advocates, ne, Sylvia, who said, okay, it's, it's wonderful to have uh, insights in this, in, in all this terminology and in the fire and in the principles, but but could we envisage anything in a kind of and, and you kindly summarize this in a kind of fair plus uh, uh, version, so so that the patient voices and, and patient need is uh, somehow included. Um, we haven't had the, the chance to, to to talk about this in detail, yeah. But but is there any aspect you could envisage so that we can follow up also here with an action item somehow? Yeah, uh, first of all, we should um, introduce these um, st standards uh, all over the world uh, yeah. by the WHO, uh, yeah. Family International Classification. And the next uh, thing we could do, and um, um, Anne could help us here, is our large language models. So if, if a doctor is writing it down in a discharge letter or wherever, we can perhaps see it then with the large language models or NLP technologies that could be the next step. Yeah, but we have to do both. To do, do, do both. Yeah, understood. So, Aku? Um, <clears throat> yes, of course, yeah. All these kind of GPT-style models, they, are, um, they could be, I mean, they could be of large help. But also, it's not like that there is a silver bullet and they will all solve this kind of problem um, at, at, at one shot. That is also not the case. So, yeah, but I see there are great promise in it. And I am very much looking forward how we can use them in a very systematic way um, to help um, to learn or get better embeddings of electronic health records or um, notes from from um, from um, health professionals, for sure. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so this is noted. Thank you so much. And and um, when when I asked at the beginning, Azilia, for for any kind of light, yeah, any any signal for hope, yeah, uh, mm -hmm. so, so that we have, of course, um, we see some progress in the past, yeah, that we are getting quicker, yeah, to medical progress. Uh, you also wanted to um, to share to, to share your thoughts. Yeah, yeah. So okay, you know, we we see two developments on one side so yes we are getting faster but on the other things also the diseases that we wanted to cure are getting more complicated mm -hmm. so it's not like that you are just like and say okay like if we would uh, address the same diseases that we have trying to come up with medication like 10 years ago now with methods now that we have we will probably be much much faster but it's not any longer the case unfortunately we have to get medicines that is like becoming very selective so, for example, binding to one protein and not to the other, or maybe not binding to two different kinds of proteins and not to the third one. So things and the, the, the modalities that we want to address is getting much more complicated. Um, there is a lot of papers out there that they are just saying that it can develop a drug in 21 days with AI. That is all something um, 
the mediciner, a very experienced mediciner would never believe that because what you then see there is just like methods or for targets that are very well observed where you have a large of data sets, but this does not work for, for new targets where you don't have any, any learning data available. So therefore we need new methods to develop this kind of, do this kind of learning. And that's where I hope that machine learning um, can help us and bring us there in this direction. It's in combination with um, physics-based methods. So where you, have, where you inform the network about certain principles of physics and chemistry. Mm -hmm. Um, when, when you uh, thank you, thank you Paul. when you listen to all this um, Bernd, yeah so so what would be your wish to get involved with? because I know that, that you um, uh, that you focus a lot also on science on stream of course yeah but, but all rare diseases so so when, when, you, when you listen to what Sylvia and Oppo said so what would be your initial thought? It really just uh, one extremely important point that was just mentioned as well is what we really also need to learn is global thinking, and uh, that that that's for me, and and I'm not even sure what the right answer on it uh, is if 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 it's more a task of global corporations like Pfizer or if it's just local governments that need to to uh, have a role in there. But let's take Arstrom as an example. Um, just today, I got a um, PowerPoint presentation uh, out of Saudi Arabia with 27 patients sitting there. We have an offer from France to identify biomarkers for Armstrong, collecting European data, including the UK. And we have uh, in America a quite strong Armstrong organization also trying to uh, push research. So we have only in this little example, on a global level, so many different activities that cannot work together right now. Because even getting the blood samples from Germany, from different regions to France uh, in a kind of legally compliant way, it's a middle nightmare. Getting them from UK into EU, similar story. Working together with the US, uh, 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 same story there and uh, with the Middle East I think it will be the same so I think we need to start more and more and again maybe there are the rare diseases because uh, it's, it's a good example because health is global and I think uh, that that's the big opportunity for us now really to start more and more thinking as well globally in terms of how can we align processes or align communication or bring patients or, or diseases together in a way that we get the right numbers that we can work with on a global level. Uh, I know there is no quick answer in it, but, but that that's for me one of the key learnings from the last, uh, whatever, 18, 24 months. Uh, there is no German, there is no European or any other way. There is a global way. And if we just understand that better, I think we we can be much more successful as, uh, as well dealing with this disease. So that's, that's one of the the thoughts that came now into my mind and uh, ju ju just uh, a, li a little bit pushed as well uh, through my recent experiences because now I'm sitting here as a BA student. I'm not even a, a medical guy having Arstrom data and what am I going to do with it, you know? And and that that's for me an unbearable situation, to be honest. Of course, of course, then. So often. Yeah. And, um, you know, there, uh, I'm a machine learning guy. So um, there is a very nice concept always out for this kind of project. So very often we want to pool the data somewhere and have it in a local database. And that is coming with a lot of problems. I know you cannot get out of data of certain regions or things. But in machine learning, we have this um, methods or uh, approach. It's called privacy preserving federated learning. So you bring the algorithms to the data. You arrive certain certain properties from the data and you're only sharing updates on the weights. So without disclosing at a certain point anything about the patient that was used, anything about the genomic data. that are. And we need these kind of much more initiatives in this direction. And we have, we were working in a large consortium funded by the European Union a couple of years ago called the Melody Project, where like 10 pharmaceutical companies 
we're sharing this kind of information with another. And you can think about like that's the core principle of the pharmaceutical companies, low chemical structures. You don't want to share them with any competitors. So what you want to want to do, you want to develop methods that allows us to extract information from those chemical structures to inform method, to inform models for everyone about maybe improving the solubility of a compound. And that is the same principle that we would need to explore um, in this context of uh, yeah, target identification, um, especially for rare diseases. There you can only win this game over large, very, very large sample sizes. Yeah. This is very, very, very interesting. I, I didn't know, of who, um, I, I think this is this is the, um, the beauty of a discussion like this, where that, that would also um, uh, people like me uh, get to know these uh, very valuable information. So I think Ben, you you also like me, I yeah, haven't heard about this before. Is there any chance, um, realistic chance, Oppo and Sylvia, to get patients like um, uh, Bernd and others kind of involved? In, not yeah, just just in in these structures, so so that they they can build up and then find find a way to to participate somehow? Yeah, in, in Germany, we have a so-called National Coordinator of Health right now since uh, 18 months, and uh, we um, in, involve patients. And especially right now, we are quite a little bit too technical, but <laughs> but I think Bernd uh, is, is a technical person as well, and he, he could and he should join because we are right now trying to get the requirements from the uh, patients and from the um, physicians for um, for new registries, for instance. And you just talked about your registry, and we can very fast work together and um, standardize the registries on the one hand side, and there are huge European pre projects going on for rare disease registries and in Germany it's called NASA and you can get in and you you're invited to get involved in these projects but also on the government uh, on the high level project uh, coordination um, of the interop council and the new interop uh, competence center at uh, the German health uh, digital health institute as well so you are invited to uh, come to us and give your expertise to to us technical people that would be great may i express that i truly love you sylvia <laughs> for your pragmatism <laughs> and that you're so hands-on and really opening the doors for patient uh, representatives and i like that so thank you really for for this wonderful wonderful um uh, proposal i think and you will go through this open door, door for sure. And thank you also, uh, Oppo, for, for explaining uh, what, 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 is, what is possible, not only on the German, but also European level. May I now open a little bit um, the discussion also for, for um, participants who we cannot see, but they can see us. And I just um, uh, got, um, got uh, 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 some... Uh, some uh, questions here. So, so what what I see here, I I I will start with this uh, question. Um, are there successful examples or best practices from other regions or countries that Germany could adopt or learn from regarding health data sharing initiatives? So, this is some uh, this is the questions of some of our participants who want to. Follow up with this question. I, I, I've learned and read that Denmark and Finland uh, seem to be quite advanced if it comes to data sharing. So, uh, but but I'd rather hand it over to the specialists if that is a true information or if I just read something wrong. Yeah, that's true. And beside that, there is a. Um insurance um, company based um, approach from Israel, but they are like uh, health management organizations and, and the insurance companies are very strong um, to uh, share and, and keep and keep and share data um, uh, in prevention as well as um, in crisis. So that uh, is, uh, uh, we are working together with Israel here and um, they have a very good network, but this is very much insurance um, uh, driven. Um, in Germany, they want to have the same, but I don't think that this is the right way because insurances in Germany are quite different to ins insurances in, in Denmark or in Israel. Uh, so we, we, we 
should have a new idea of thinking how to work with data and why we document data. If we document data just for reimbursement, we all, we only get biased reimbursement data and then we cannot really do machine learning on this data because there's a huge, huge bias. So, but, but there are several countries who really do public health and there's this new um, institution which is called DPAM. Uh, right now in Germany, they want to um, combine um, cancer research data with um, insurance data, hopefully with our data as well from the university hospitals, and that could be the um, yeah the goal to do it like that. Thank you, Sylvia. Um, there's another question here from the chat, and um, this is what is your valuation of Go Live for uh, in the EU? TI healthcare structure where everyone can grant e, prescript, uh, e prescriptions digitally from each EU country. Was this clear? Hmm? I, I think this is the old idea to have one EHR and one e prescription uh, from EPSOS, European Patient Smart Open Services, a uh, huge project in the EU, Horizon, oh, FP7 project. And uh, there we want to share uh, e prescriptions. I, I hope, hopefully, this is the right answer. Didn't get it really good. Yeah. But this is the goal. But first of all, we do have to have a international terminology for drugs. That's the point, and not the e prescription uh, app. Uh, this is easy. But we don't have the terminology, uh, yeah. which is used worldwide. IDMP is the name of this standard for terminologies uh, for e-prescriptions. Yeah, thank you, thank you also for all these questions. But because I think um, your questions help all of us, yeah, to to learn more in this complex topic. There's another question. Um, it's from a startup, I guess. My question is. Uh, uh, any advice on how we can, as an early startup, connect with partners to help uh, take our product on healthcare professionals? So I'm not sure. Yeah. How to take their product to whoever? To healthcare professionals. This is what, what I can see here. Yeah. How so, to take it? It's difficult to judge it as we do not know the product, but yeah, um, yeah. I, I only can encourage them to to keep on pushing, keep on going, uh, and send us an email afterwards explaining what they are doing. And uh, I think we are happy to help because yeah, we need the dynamics of startups. So, so, they, so yeah, hmm? they could be a diga. They should read. Uh, uh, the requirements for a diga digital application in Germany. Uh, at mm -hmm. Farm, and there you see all the criteria. And first of all, they should read if if they can really they do it. It's very hard to get it to the market because it's a medical device here, yep. MDR, and so on, and safety, mm -hmm. security, gender bias, and so on. And you have to really be aware of many things. Yeah, yeah. there is another. There is a long one. How do you envision the future standardization of computer tomography images? Background of the question would be there was an FDA meeting in the US and the large corporations could not agree on standards with regard to the Poundsville units. Sorry, I don't know what it is. For example, the basic value for the density in CT scans requiring the use of so-called phantoms. Yeah, if I know what, what, what she's talking about. So Hounsfeld unit is the unit of the CT or radiography. Yeah. And um, the, the, this is not really a really Hounds, Hounsfeld is not an SI unit. So it's mm -hmm. a grayscale. And um, they don't even agree on the grayscale level when it's uh, getting uh, like um, um, when it's being harmful. So this is the first problem Be beside the IT standardization. You have other standardization issues and we should uh, wor uh, talk in, on a worldwide level on this. It's the same with the MRT, MRI, medical um, re um, resonance imaging. They have different, if you have a, like a Siemens um, device and the Philips and the GE device, they have different um, sequences. So the spin echo 
is uh, other than on, on a machine of another vendor, and that's a problem, and not the IT behind it. Yeah. Oh, oh. so interesting. Uh, uh, I know business it, um, business uh, um, ideas. So. Ah. Good. Um, now I have another question from the chat. Thank you, Maria. How can we more effectively weave away the often disconnected social determinants of health into these big patient data sets to get a richer picture? So I understand the combination of social data and big patient data. This is what I guess is meant here. Any ideas? Yeah, I didn't fully get it, but 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 uh, I, I had one one recommendation or or idea which maybe fits uh, the answer uh, the, the the question that was answered. When, when I was going through this EHDS uh, documentation, I found a graph where uh, there was an explanation about roles, and there were many roles, and there was one role saying uh, data owner. And underneath data owner, you found doctors and, and whoever. But I didn't find one description on this whole graph. It was the patient. And uh, that, that concerned me a little bit because we we're talking about patient involvement. And maybe I got the question wrong, but I heard something like, how can we get involved there as well? And that, that would be one of my advices as well. If we want to be serious about involving patients, we need to gain trust 